oldest and strongest human emotion is fear. And the oldest and strongest type of fear is trepidation of the unknown. When we were children, our parents told us that monsters didn't exist. But we were sure that something was lurking under the bed or in the closet. Fear sees even if our eyes are closed. Welcome to the realm of the arcane. My name is Lon Strickler. Join me as I examine unexplained creatures, strange manifestations, and remarkable realities. Imagine this next hour as a voyage of discovery to strange lands, seeking not for new territory, but for new knowledge of the supernatural. Come on board as we begin this adventure together. Hey folks, good evening and welcome to another episode of Arcane Radio. I'm your host, Lon Strickler, and I thank you for joining me here on the Paranormal King Radio Network. Now, before I introduce my guest, I just want to mention that um, uh, the past three or four weeks, we've been receiving a, a fair amount of uh, wing humanoid sightings in northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin. So, uh, you know, I think it's about been about four of them all together in, this, in that amount of time. So we're going to see if this picks up again this year. Now, we kind of have a, had a lull back in 2018 after the 2017 flap. But uh, all indications are that something's stirring out there again. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. And when it does, we will let you know. So let's get started. Tonight's guest is the king of YouTube horror, Dark Waters. Now, Dark Wars burst onto the paranormal community in 2015 with his unique storytelling abilities. Hailing from New Orleans, Louisiana, a paranormal hotspot, Dark Waters' down home southern vernacular combined with his smooth voice and outgoing personality quickly made him a household name. Now, Dark Waters' unique high quality audio content mentally takes you to the scene of the paranormal encounter and safely allows you to relive every breathtaking moment. Dark Waters maintains a massive library of true encounters by making himself publicly available, taking up to 30 phone calls per week. His website can be found at IamDarkWaters.com. So, D.W., thanks for joining me. What's been going on, Lon? How you been, my friend? Uh, we, I've been busy. I've been sick, actually, but beyond that, I've been busy trying to get a book written and you know, with the blog and all the other things going on, it's been busy around here. Well, no, that busy is good. Busy is good. And before we get started again, I like to always thank you because you've always been from the beginning, one of the earliest supporters of the Dark Waters brand. So I appreciate you and I honor you for helping me get the ball rolling. I mean, you were one of the first guys to, to actually jump on board with me. So I just wanted to say publicly say thank you. Like I always do. Oh, it's much appreciated. So, uh, What's been going on in your neck of the woods? What's been, uh, what's you've had kind of reports you've been receiving? Man, I've been getting all kinds of stuff. Um, from, uh, DMT dog man encounters to, uh, goat man in Brazil to mm. shadow people, demons. It's, um, I get stuff from all over the boards. This, it really boils down to people are starting to see more and more strange things. At first I thought it was uh, a proliferation of people kind of making things up and I was getting so many phone calls. I was like, well, maybe people listen to YouTube shows and, and deciding that they want to be a part of the show because that's one of the things that I've experienced is that someone wants to kind of get some kind of critical acclaim or fame by coming on with like a great story and then launch their own career. I thought that's what it was, but then I started getting more and more phone calls from people and they don't want, you know, their stories necessarily told. They just want a listening ear, someone that they know will listen to them and not judge them. So it's, we got a lot of strange things going on right now all around the world. And it's kind of scary to me. Um, I know that most people listening in the audience, they, they don't really understand the dynamics of it and how it all works. It's one thing to kind of participate from, you know, like a fan in the stands at a basketball game, right? And mm -hmm. and watch the game being played and listen to the audio in your car and 
But it's another thing when you're on a court and like LeBron James is jumping over you, dunking on you. You know what I'm saying? And it's, mm-hmm. it's kind of gets scary once you're on the court and on the playing field and people are calling you, telling you demonic encounters after demonic encounter after demonic encounter. And, it, and it's, it's crazy. But then on the other end, I've been having some very, very, and I'll share this with you. I've never told anybody this, but I've been having some very, very great, positive, godly encounters to the point to where it's uh, it's amazing. I mean, it really, really is. So we can get into both both sides yeah. of the coin. We can get into the kind of the darker side and then the light side because I think I need to start sharing a lot more of the lighter side of things as well because I don't want to just like glorify the bad things, you know? Oh, I agree with you. I mean, I understand that completely. I mean, that's uh, that's something that I've gone through as well. I mean, you know, you, when you, you've got to go out there and help people out, and uh, there is some satisfaction to that. And as you do that, it, it kind of comes back on you. So um, I completely understand that, and I'm be glad to hear that. Well, I'll tell you like this. Uh, i got to tell a little bit of my personal business to, um, to get into it. So... Going back last year, beginning of the year, I was in like this state of change and flux. I needed to move, um, get a new place to live. Um, The lady that I was renting a house from, her and I relationship was like a a mother and son relationship. But she was getting older. She started getting dementia. And... Um, her kids started coming in and kind of taking over stuff. I didn't really have good relationships with her kids. And so it started this flux of was she going to sell the house or was she going to um, keep the house? So it went back and forth. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to keep it. I offered to buy it. She didn't want to sell it to me, right? So we went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Simultaneously at the same time, I was having very, very dark encounters in the house, Mm. like um, stuff climbing in the bed with me, um, a 12 foot tall shadow man, like literally walking out of my son's room down the hallway that I witnessed and watched laying on a bed, you know, with both eyes. It wasn't like it was out the corner of my eye. Um, and that whole phase of turmoil in my life caused me to really start praying a lot more. So, and this is a long story short, but you know, I'm going to keep the long story long. We got time. So I go into praying more and more and more and more. Right. And we're talking about I'm doing radio shows at my desk and the meters, which are on the computer, like the digital soundboard are moving while I'm on the interview. Like I'm literally sitting there watching the meters go up and down, up and down, up and down while I'm doing these interviews. And I'm freaking out because I'm like, man, what's moving these meters? I mean, just imagine your soundboard that's in front of any producer, anybody who's seen a soundboard. Imagine a volume meter going up and down, up and down, up and down, but my volume is not fluctuating while I'm on air with the individual that I'm talking to. It's just going up and down in front of me like something's messing with me. I had, um, sitting in that same room, I had drops of water fall from the ceiling where there was no water leak, where the liquid falls on my arm. So, like, crazy stuff is really, really happening. So far, so much so to the point to where I build an altar to God in my house and I have my Bible on the altar. It gets crazy, so. Um, I go through my prayers. I start praying over and over and over and over and over again, really, really getting heavy into my prayer life. And then out of the blue line, this phone number calls me. Actually, the phone number just called just now when we were, when we first started the line, it's a three, three, seven number. I get a phone call from this number and it's this preacher that's just talking. And he's like, you know, the Lord is telling me that you're in a a change, uh, a time of flux and change that he wants you to know prophetically that your life is fine. He's got to show you some things in order for you to go to the next level. And I'm like, how in, how in the hell did this, this, it's like a voice record. It's not an individual, but it's a record. I'm like, well, how did this get my number? Right. So I'm curious. So it's like, press one. If you want to hear more, so I'm like, you damn right. I press one boop. And I listen a little bit long and I'm like, that was weird. But it's about 15 seconds long and I hang up. Right. Um, everything starts going down with the house with, um, with the lady I was living in and I have to move extremely fast. I'm talking about like within four or five days I have to move and I'm stressing out over it. I'm like, this is ridiculous, you know? And, and I'm like, I got to come up with all this money. And I I think I ended up having to come up with like something like $13,000. It was ridiculous to get everything arranged and moved and simultaneously paying tuition because the school year is doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Right. 
out of the blue, thirteen thousand dollars comes. I'm like, well, it's thirteen racks. I mean, okay, great. Spend it, move, bam, everything is settled. And I'm like, all right, I continue to pray. Then more stuff starts happening. And every time something negative was coming, this phone call would happen. And it would ring, and it would be this guy just talking. The next phone call was like, well, God wants you to know that um, he's aware of your financial situation because you just spent a lot of money unexpectedly. And there's no way. I never talked to this voicemail line. I want you to understand. If you can only listen. And it, it says, you know, you spent a lot of money unexpectedly and you're worried about money. God wants you to know that he's taken care of you since you were a child. Don't worry about it. Keep on plow moving forward. And I, I don't know if it was plowing forward or sowing forward or whatever. It was keep moving forward. Click. I hang up the phone. Right. right. I'm like, that's weird. Super weird. And keep on. But I'm not worried about it. Keep on moving forward. Then it rings again, and then and I'm in the middle of working a deal with a, a TV network called Binge TV to do uh, video distribution through Roku and Google um, Fire Stick and all like so it'll be like a thousand distribution channels where my content will be on on all these channels. I talk to the people for like uh, about a week or so. We're going back and forth. I'm ready to do the deal. Phone rings. It's a number. It says. There's someone coming after you with a contract and they want to get you to sign a document and it's going to hurt you. Don't sign the document. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I'm like, whoa, but you got to hear the rest of it line. So I'm like, all right, I go and I have a, this ritual that I do every morning. I get up, I have a cup of coffee. I read my Bible. I smoke cigars. I have to do this because this keeps the bad stuff from around me. And so I'm smoking my cigar and I said, well, God, I said, I guess I need to start asking you questions. But this is getting out of hand. I said, so why is this, you know, why is this number calling me? And is this true? Don't hear nothing. And, and normally when I hear a voice in the back of my mind, I know that's God speaking to me. I don't hear nothing. I'm just finished smoking my cigar, going about my business. I get an email that night, late, 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 late that night, like 11 o'clock. And it says, it's from the lady who owns the network. And she says, well, we're going to not, no longer be doing audio content the only way you can work with us is if you were to create all video content. Now, prior to that, the deal was you had to put up like $5,000 for the distribution agreement, but right. everything was based on you can do video and audio. My content is 90% audio. So I would have put up $5,000 and took a big L because now all of a sudden they don't use uh, audio content. They only use video content. So I was like, whoa, that's crazy. And it goes on and on. And it's every time. Like when we get off the phone, I'm going to call the number back just to see what it has to say because it's every time it does that. And I think that's amazing because it's one thing for people to call me with, you know, negative encounters. But it's another thing when you're getting like God on the main line telling you, hey, don't worry about this. Hey, don't do this. Hey, don't do that. And when I tell you, I never asked this number to call. I don't know how this number started calling me, why this number started calling me. And I just said, you know what? I'm just going to let it go and let it happen. So that's been one of the more positive things that's been going on. And then I've had people call me with angel encounters, which there are some major, um, I mean, some really, really beautiful stories of people who've had angelic encounters. One that comes to mind is this lady was pregnant. She's actually here in New Orleans. She's a nurse pause let me rewind and give you guys some background around this so my sister just had two twin boys so i'm going to the hospital to um to hang out with her because her blood pressure is all high and i think it's called preeclampsia that a lot of black women get when they have babies where their blood rush blood pressure skyrockets and mm -hmm. normally it could kill them so my sister calls she says hey jay can you come hang out with me for a little while um you always make me feel better so all right, i go in the hospital and i'm there for about an hour and she's like, well, I want to listen to some of your horror stories. She's like, I haven't listened in a while. Let me hear some of your best work. So she's listening to one of the stories. We just kind of chilling. We're in a dark room because, you know, we get high blood pressure, you have headaches and all the rest of it. So we sit in the dark room. She's like, oh, my God, this is so amazing. And we're just kind of talking and walks the nurse. The nurse is pregnant. And she's saying, um, she says, what's that you guys listening to? So my sister's like, well, that's my brother, and he's dark waters, and he does this, 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 this. So there's this long kind of conversation about how I got started, why I do it, bada bing, bada boom. Nurse leaves, comes back with a thing of water, and she says, well, I want to tell you one of my stories. 
She's like, do you only do scary stories? I said, I do all kinds of stories. So she goes into how just three days prior to that, she was riding in a car. Um, and she was headed to work and she works on Williams Boulevard in New Orleans, which is where this hospital was. And basically when you're coming in to New Orleans from like Baton Rouge or from, um, or anywhere like Mississippi or Texas, you got to come this way. So anybody who's driven in New Orleans, you've seen the sign for Williams Boulevard. Well, she's coming into work, driving down the street, and there's this intersection where you kind of cross under the bridge. You got to get off the interstate and cross under a bridge and go um, straight down. So she's crossing under the bridge, and the light is green. She sees the light green. She knows the light's green. She reaches down and grabs her phone, and after she grabs her phone, she kind of hits the gas and looks up the light is now yellow and it quickly turns red according to her as that light turned red she looked to her right and the there was this pickup truck a ford f-150 barreling down on her and in new orleans we're kind of notorious for pulling off um before the light turns green so people kind of look at the one light like you can look, if you're sitting at a stop sign, stop light, you can look at the other lights to see that it's yellow and it's about to turn so you can go. So we're kind of notorious for looking at the other lights, say, okay, it's yellow now, let me hit the gas and go. So clearly that's what the other driver was doing. So she goes forward, this truck is barreling down on her, she hits the gas on her car to try and speed up and the car starts to stall. And she says, James, I tell you, my car never stalls. She said it, 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 it never does anything crazy like that. It's kind of jilting and shaking and stalling. And she says somehow that truck moved right in front of my car. And I was like, well, what do you mean move right in front of your car? She's like, it was barreling down on my passenger side door. She's like, I didn't go forward. I didn't go in reverse. But somehow that truck passed right in front of the bumper. I'm like, well, that's, that's not really paranormal it should have swerved. It could have swerved. She was like, no, it was too close to swerve. And I was like, what do you mean it was too close to swerve? She says, no way he could have cut his wheel and went around me because he was already on me. So she kind of draws a drawing of how she's in the right lane closer to the traffic. And she's like, closer to the intersection where they're coming. She's like, there's no way he could have swerved. There was no room for him to swerve. And when I'm leaving the hospital that evening, I go back that route and I realize she's right the way the curve is set up and the way there's this little structure there, there's no way that this guy could have swerved. She's like, somehow he passed right in front of me. And I was like, Whoa. And she was like, um, I believe that was an angel that was looking out for me and protected me. I said, well, did you see anything that led you to believe that it was an angel? And she was like, well, when I got to work and I got into the emergency room and I was walking through the emergency room entrance, I looked down this kind of dark corridor where they were doing, construction work. And she said, I saw this big, bright, white ball of light. And she said that out of the ball of light, she could see that it had like two legs and two arms. She said, I couldn't see a face, but it was a ball of light with legs and arms. And it was just there. And I was like, well, that's, that's enough to make me believe that it was an angelic encounter. And so we are having people share these kind of stories all the time. I mean, I really am having people share those kind of stories all the time, which is great, Glenn, because I really want to move away a little bit from the darker side of things. Yeah. Because what I've discovered is the more I talk about the dark side, the more it actually is attracted to me. Um, well, that happens. Which, I mean, yeah, I agree with that. You know, and uh, that's a um, scary thing, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I get all kinds of crazy stuff. You know that, too. And, uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes wonder if that kind of rubs off at some point. Uh, there have been po- times when. I've experienced somewhat of what people I'm working with will have, and uh, but you know, you know that I'm I I believe deeply in angels. I've been very I'm very spiritual as far as that goes, and I also believe being very positive and the law of attraction work hand in hand. And uh, I think what you're experiencing in particular is just not an accident. So, uh, no, I know it's not an accident. I can tell you for sure. It's not an accident. And I can tell you because, and I mean, let's just make a little bit more personal stuff. So prior, while all that other stuff I was telling you was going on, um, I have a business partner, like most people don't know this about me, but I own 
uh, an insurance company. I run the Dog Orders brand. I have part ownership in a real estate brokerage company. And um, we just started back up our construction company. Mm -hmm. So my business partner in the real estate business, I didn't know it was getting as bad as it was, but he was kind of complaining about us losing commissions. He kept on saying, man, you know, I don't know what's going on, but we lose the commissions. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, you know, we just keep losing deals. Normally when he and I are on the same page, we kind of have the golden touch and there's really nothing that you can do to stop it. So finally I kind of go over and I sit down with them. We start looking at the numbers. Well, over a four month span, we lost $90,000 worth of commissions. Right. Deal after deal after deal was falling through. So, um, he's getting angry with God and upset and saying, God, why'd you do this to me? And, you know, kind of spaz it out. And we discovered that one of his employees had taken a book out of, out of our office. It was the fifth and sixth, uh, books of Moses. I don't know if you're familiar with that book. Very familiar with it. So she had taken the fifth and sixth book of Moses and she was actually using his book to do kind of do spells and whatever the hell she was doing with it. Right. So it all comes out because she come, well, it all comes out this way. There's a, a very, very powerful voodoo voodoo and priestess down here named Sally Ann Glassman, really, really sweet lady. I mean, cool as they come. Well, this young lady goes to miss Sally for help about, you know, what was going on with her. So, you know, she tells Miss Sally what was going on and she kind of had the book and she opened up some things that she shouldn't. And anybody who has that book knows that it did smack in the center of that book. There is a number of seals, about six seals, maybe five seals Mm -hmm. that are purely 100% demonic. I mean, it's dead smack in the center of the book. Those are a no-go zone, purely demonic seals. Some of the other stuff is angels' names. There's some ones in the back that are like, Bell worship with where people used to sacrifice babies to Bell, but for the most part, those middle ones are bad juju, right? So, mm-hmm. of course, she gets the book, she goes to the middle ones, <laughs> she gets all screwed up, and she goes to Miss Sally. Um, now, Miss Sally and I are cool because in one of our other businesses that pretty much failed, we had a credit card processing company, but she's one of our only clients in our credit card processing company where we process our transactions. So, she goes to Miss Sally. She's talking about where she got the book from, and Sally knows us. She calls and she says, hey, uh, you guys need to come over here and, and talk to me. I'm like, what's up, Miss Sally? She's like, well, did you know that she had this book? And we were like, no. She couldn't possibly have the book. And it's like, no, she has the book. She brought the book in it with my business partner's name written in it. Mm. And so we like, holy crap. I'm like, how the hell did she get it? We go back to the office. Look, it's missing. Okay, so this chick has the book. After all this transpires, she finally comes forward, the young lady, and admits that she took it and starts telling us everything that she did. So her thing was she wanted to have more money and more power. So she called herself doing a deal with doing a rituals with one of the demonic forces to get money and power. Mm -hmm. The problem was she was getting a little bit of money, but all the backlash was coming back on our business because it was my business partner's book. Mm -hmm. So now we're dealing with all that. And I'm telling you the story to kind of tell you about what's going on with him and how God actually helped us with him. So um, he goes through this phase where we lost all his commission. And on the other end, we realized that, man, you know, we, we really have to get rid of this. So I talked to Kenneth Deal. I don't know if you know Kenneth and Farrah Deal, the demonologist. Mm-hmm. And uh, Kenneth's like, well, Jay, you kind of need to do a bunch of praying. And I was like, well, I pray every day. He's like, no, but you got to specifically do prayers for this because there really is no way of knowing exactly what this girl did. She might not be telling you guys the truth. She could be demonized, could be anything. So we go through 21 days of prayer in order to kind of break this curse that this girl had put out there Mm -hmm. trying to, you know, gain wealth and gain power. After the 21 days, the deals start coming back. The commissions start coming back slowly, but there's still some effect on the business from it because we still have some falling through prior to this. We had like an 85% close rate. 
um, for that time period, it went down to zero. Now it's probably at about 65% of our deals are closing. And I say that to say, number one, for people listening, stay away from that stuff. Number two, prayer actually works yeah. to protect you and defend you. You know what I'm saying? It's seductive. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But stay away from it, you know? You know, in, in particular, the fifth and sixth book of Moses, I mean, it, you, if you don't understand it, don't mess with it. And, uh, I mean, the, the Kabbalah is based in that book. There's, uh, you know, a, a, lot, a, a lot of the stylized Creole religions um, are based on a lot of what's in the fifth and sixth book of Moses as well. So, uh, yeah, you're right. The, the, it has the, the, the sigils and the... Uh, and the seals. Uh, markers and seals in there. Yeah, yeah, you start throwing those around, you're going to get yourself in a bind. So I can yep. definitely understand and and uh, what you've been you were going through with that. It's good. It's good she got a hold of you. Yeah, well, she's a, she's she's cool. With good people. She's good people. And I, I've had people say, "Well, man, you're a Christian and she's a witch and." How do you, you know, how can you all say, no, man, I associate with all kinds of people. I mean, just because a person chooses a certain path, that, that's their path. That's not my path. I'm not going to mistreat right. someone because of their path. I only treat people badly who treat me badly. And I guess that's not exactly the Christian way, but I only so much I can take. You know what I'm saying? I'll give you a couple of passes. <laughs> After that, I'm going to have to put my foot on you. Yeah. But um, so we've experienced that. And it's been amazing, though, because going back to the phone call, remember I told you about the phone call about, um, God is going to let you experience some things and see mm -hmm. some things. Mm -hmm. You got to put that, you got to looking from a hundred thousand foot view in the airline. When I kind of step back and look at it, it was like, wow, I am experiencing and seeing things that, um, that kind of solidify my faith because of the simple fact that, okay, not only did I have clearly a, that shadow thing was a demon. I, I'll tell you more about that later that came into the house mm -hmm. and I, and I'll tell you why it came. Um, but that happened. And then I have this where it's affecting the business. But, and if you remember a long time ago, when we first started talking, I really had a genuine fear of like demonic entities. And I wouldn't talk to anybody who had something demonic and yes, you know, you just did. like, nah, I'm not doing it. Remember that? Yes, you did. Um, well, what's transpired since then is because I've been hit with so much crap. It's kind of like, you know, being a, a kid who's getting bullied, right? You don't know how to fight. You get punched in the nose. You go home, try and run home, come back next day, get punched in the nose again. Now you got a black eye. Eventually, you really learn how to fight. And so now I've learned how to defend myself um, from this stuff and help others defend themselves, which to me is great. And I think that's why I experienced it. And that's why it gives me the ability to talk about it and kind of help other people with it. But I think I had to go through that um, in order to really, really understand it. You know, because well, if you I don't go through good. it, you don't really understand it. I think it's good. I I, I think there's room for you to show the, the light side as, as opposed to the dark side. I mean, there, there there's, um, you know, I, I think there's something cathartic, cathartic about it because, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, you know, you're going to hear it. So, uh, right. you know, I, and the fact that you bring it to light, I think is good. No, and I think that's I think that's a more powerful thing. Um, and then the craziest thing. So a couple of months ago, I did an interview with uh, with Wes Garmer, Tony Merkel, and Timothy Weiser, mm -hmm. and we did this roundtable discussion. Right, we're talking about cryptids and Dog Man and all the rest of this. And so finally, I kind of started really hammering away at the concept because people, were, where does Dog Man come from? Where does this come from? So I kind of started hammering away at um, Genesis six and, um, fallen angels and hybrids and all the rest of this. Right. Mm -hmm. And to me, it started, it started seeing a lot of these encounters that I were getting was getting from people really seemed demonic, like dog man popping up in people's bedroom and dog man outside the window, looking in, they go outside, nothing's there. And there's not enough time for something to move from where it was to across the fence in a way before they were able to open the door and go and look and see. And I was like, man, this stuff really, really sounds demonic. So I was like, I'm wondering if uh, some of this stuff is demonic manifestations or if it's some kind of interdimensional entity. 
And I got a little bit of confirmation on this because I started talking to these gentlemen out of California who use DMT. And this is crazy. You, you're familiar with DMT, right? The drug that people use to right. kind of open portals in their minds. Right. So I'm talking to this gentleman, I, and I didn't know what it was, to be honest with you. He was like, yeah, man, you ever talk to anybody who calls me? He says, you ever talk to anybody who use DMT? I'm like, oh, what the hell is DMT? And, and, and he's like, well, you know, it's this drug that we take and we smoke it and it, and it gets us high, but it's like a high you've never had before. And you, and you go into this other world. And I'm like, I don't really want to talk to drug addicts, bro. I mean, that was, that was the first, you know, response. All right, all right. Like, I don't, I don't want to talk to drug addicts. He's like, no, 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 no. So I really want to tell you about my trip because I think, you know, my trip might enlighten you on some of the things that have been going on with people. And I'm like, nah, bro, I don't want to talk to drug addicts, man. I, it's like, I said, this crazy you the fact that you're on drugs. He's like, well, look, do some research on DMT and then call me back if you're interested in the story. I was kind of rude, too. I, you know, that's I like me to really be rude, but it's just like, dog, I don't want to talk to a drug addict. So days pass, and I'm like, well, let me look into this DMT. So I started Googling it, and I started researching it. And I'm like, oh, okay, so, you know, people in Silicon Valley are using DMT, and then I start finding about ayahuasca and these retreats where people are seeing things and then um i was like well let me see what this guy's talking about because this is supposed to open up a portal on your mind to where you can see the other dimensions that are there and i'm like all right well, well let's let's find out what the guy's talking about so i call him back and now he doesn't want to talk so i'm like all right well cool I'm like listen bro call me whenever you want to i'm interested in hearing your story this dude calls me while me and my uh girlfriend are having dinner and he's like man you know i got an hour to talk and i want to tell you the story take it or leave it so I tell her, I said, listen, let me listen to this guy's story, babe. And I'll put it on speakerphone and, you know, we'll talk. So she and I are sitting there eating. He's on speakerphone. And I'm like, all right, man, tell me about kind of your trip. And so he goes into it and he's like, man, it started off pretty cool. He was like, I was on the sofa and I smoked it, kind of laid back. And he's like, you know, once you smoke this stuff, he's like, you know, your arms get heavy. You can feel, you barely feel like you can move. And he said the room started kind of twisting and spinning, and I saw the brightest, most beautiful colors I've ever seen in my life. And he says, but then it started getting real weird because I found myself inside this forest. And he said it was a blue forest. And I was like, what you mean a blue forest? Like the ground was blue? He's like, no, the trees were blue. And he's like, but it, it wasn't like I was on the ground. He's like, I was looking down at myself from being in the air. And like I was above myself looking down at myself in the forest. and he said he started to kind of walk around and then he saw the tree swing and he could tell that something was breathing. And every time there was this breath blowing, the trees were swaying. I was like, Oh, that's kind of freaky and weird, bro. And he's like, yeah. He said, but no, wait till you hear the rest of this crap. And I was like, all right. He says, then I dropped down into my body. Like I come, I literally dropped down into my body. I'm in on the ground amongst the trees. And he said, I see this gigantic dog, man. It looks like Anubis walking taller than the trees and it walks up to me and it says worship me and i'm like what did he tell you he said it said worship me bow down and worship me mm -hmm. and i was like well did you bow down and worship it and he was like no i was just confused he said because you got to realize man i had just came from candy canes and rainbows and flowers and spinning circles and it was beautiful and now i got this gigantic golden eyed anubis telling me to worship it and I'm like, well, what did you do? He said, I refused to worship him. And I said, well, what happened? He said, I tried to turn and run. And then my feet started to sink into the ground and I was stuck there. And he said, man, it felt like I was there for years. And this thing was commanding me to worship it. And I was like, well, what else did it tell you? And it just told him to worship him. And many others are worshiping it. And I should worship it too. I was like, well, how did you come out of your trip? Cause I don't, I don't do drugs. Like, the only drug I do is a cigar and I might drink a little bit of Hennessy and I'll drink a mimosa here and there when I'm with, you know, with the ladies trying to hang out. I don't do drugs. And he's like, well, it, I was there for a long time and it was telling me to worship it. And then finally the trip changed and I started going back into this kaleidoscope of colors and uh, circles and rainbows and candy canes. And there were candy canes walking around and kids bouncing on trampolines and, but their faces were spinning. And I was like, wow. And so I said, well, bro, what did you think that means? I said, I don't know what that means. I said, I just think you're on drugs. He's like, I really think that it's a, a being that's demanding worship. And he said, I don't listen to dog man stuff anymore because I feel like 
that's worshiping this entity. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty deep, bro. I was like, that's pretty freaking deep. And I know for a fact that other people who've been on DMT actually have, you know, um, encounters with clockwork elves and um, all kinds of crazy demonic beings um, while they're on DMT. Mm. Um, and, and that's kind of scary. Have you ever heard anything like that? Yeah, I, I, I've read a couple of accounts of, with people that have used DMT. It's, um, you know, I, I, I don't know what to really think of it, to be honest with you. I mean, it, it does, you know, some of what people talk about seems like uh, being in a type of, uh, oh, I don't know, some type of uh, deep uh, hallucinatory state but you know i guess i guess it reacts different to everybody i, I think it not, does i'm not sure about it. i mean yeah uh, well i thought it was interesting because of some of the fact that this thing was commanding him to worship it i thought that was i thought that yeah, was interesting. i thought it was really before. really interesting you know i and the reason I, why go ahead i'm sorry no go ahead no i was gonna say the reason why i think it's i do think it may be something to it because I've said over and over and over, out of all the topics in the paranormal world, that is the one topic where I've seen people, I used to think Bigfoot people kind of behave kind of cultish and crazy, right. but I've never seen such fanatical people as I've seen the people who kind of listen to Dogman stories. You know what I'm saying? Like, they really get fanatical and crazy about it um, to the point to where it's like, it, 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 it's, it's overboard how crazy the people behave over that particular topic. And that's why I kind of feel like maybe there's some truth to it because I've, I've been in a whole bunch of Bigfoot groups. I've been in dogman groups. I'm in ghost groups. I'm in demon groups. I have accounts in groups on Facebook and I got a following things on Twitter. Nobody really knows what account is there, but I sit there and I read. And when I start looking at how people behave across all those groups, mm. it's these dogmen people that really go, you know, ape crap crazy. Right. Almost like it's, they have to listen to it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I have to listen to it. I have to know about it. I have to watch it. And there's, it's not like it's a necessity, but, yeah. and I even had people who contacted me after I brought that up and it was like, yeah, you know, I thought about what you said, man. And I, I do feel like I was getting addicted to it and I don't understand why. And I was like, yeah. And it was like, I listen to all kinds of, there are people who sleep listening to dog man stories and dog man interviews and uh, consume hours and hours of it. I'm like, yeah. And it, it's it's not that fascinating to me. I don't understand why it's that fascinating to people, you know? Well, I tell you, you know, Butch and I, Butch Wachowski and I have been investigating this uh, upright canine dog man phenomena in Pennsylvania for the most part. And um, it does seem like there's a mystical aspect to it. Now, I'm not saying just supernatural, like, oh, it might be an uh, interdimensional being, like some people think Bigfoot are too. But I believe that there's a mystical aspect to it as well. There's something that, you know, when you, you know, you start talking about this the gentleman who thought that he had seen Anubis. Well, maybe there's a connection spiritual wise or mystically wise with this. Maybe it's something that draws people more. Yeah, it's got to be something. I mean, I'm telling you, it has to be something because they're so... Put it to you like this. Every dog man encounter story that someone tells me doesn't kind of cut the mustard for me to even repeat it, right? Right. But at the end of the day, there was a time period where, man, I would get three, four calls a day about people having dog man encounters, and it just doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense, and to this day it doesn't make sense because there's no way that there's that many people seeing these, these, uh, these creatures in the woods. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's not possible. Numerically, it's not possible, you know? So to me, that's when I started, I shied away from it a lot because then I said, well, you know, this is kind of getting oversaturated. And then it kind of took off and went in a creepy pasta direction where people were kind of just making up crap. And what I've, what I've under, what I've come to understand is that people are taking things that are not factually true and they're passing it off as truth. And yeah. then that gets repeated and parroted over and over. And now the water kind of gets murky and muddy. And you don't know what, what the hell a person actually saw. I've had people repeat back to me stuff that I've said. And be like, well, 
this is this. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm the one who told people about that, you know? So I I do think there's gotta be something to it. I think there's a spiritual aspect to that, that kind of makes it a lot more attractive to people. You know what I'm saying? Which to me, it's like a lot of other things. I mean, I think that we could saturate to a point where people may also start manifesting these things through the thought form. Um, you know, I, I, I deeply believe that, you know, you, you hear people talk about the slender man phenomena and things like that. And, uh, you know, this, it's gotta be a being that is self manifested, just like a poltergeist. It's a self self manifested entity. I mean, this very well could be the same phenomena. No, I think it may be. I think it may be because I think it's it's kind of taken off and went in a direction where you have so many people focused on it and so much yeah. energy being put into it yeah. that I really believe that that's where it's getting to. It may be I'm not saying that they don't have physical creatures in the woods because I've seen prints and I've yeah. seen a couple of videos that actually look like something that that really looked like an upright walking canine, but um, for the most part, there is no real good evidence. The people that I know that had evidence, that evidence was taken from them really, really quickly. Right. I mean, real quickly, which was crazy. Um, and I've seen prints, but as far as like, if you, for example, you go and look for Bigfoot evidence. There's YouTube channels like with the guy Thinker Thumper who has evidence of, you know, there's one where there's a Bigfoot in a car camera. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the rear view camera of a car, you can see it chasing the car. Mm -hmm. There's evidence where you can see them throwing trees in Russia. Like you see the whole tree come up out of the ground and it's thrown. You can follow the trajectory of the tree. You can see everything. You know, there's the, the Patterson Gimlin film when it comes to Bigfoot, there's overwhelming evidence of Bigfoot. Why is there, you know, why is there no real overwhelming evidence of dog man? At this point in time, that's public. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like yeah. real evidence. Well, you and know, that's I, what's starting them. I, I absolutely. I mean, Butch and I both acknowledge that a lot of these sightings that we have received over the years may very well be may, may very well have a, a deep supernatural thing to it. I mean, I mean, it's even the description that the people give, the witnesses give of it having a a type of uh, a sheen to it or uh, a spooky look to it. Like it's kind of, you know, half, half real and half spiritual and, you know, things like that. So yeah, yeah I, I think there's something to that. Yeah. And that, that's, and so that's kind of where I stand on dog man now. And I, and I reserve the right to change my opinion. That's one of the things <laughs> I think is crazy because people like you said this, or did you know, I reserve, yeah. I, I want everybody to know. I reserve the right to change my opinion on anything at any point in time and to change my mind at any point in time, which most people don't do. So that's kind of where I, I am on dog man at this point, because it's just getting way, 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 way too weird for me. Yeah. I mean, it's really getting weird. Well, um, it's, it's, it's a phenomena that when you think about it, it's really hard to believe at some point. I mean, you know, you're talking about, a, eight, nine, ten foot bipedal wolf-like creature that looks like a werewolf that's just standing there looking at people. Uh, I mean, no doubt people think they saw something, but it's a, it's a, it's a very hard to believe phenomena. I mean, you know, and, you know, I've heard a lot of the stories, you know, over the years, but it's, um, it, it, it's it's still kind of hard for me to to buy into, though. I, I'm not saying people are lying to me. I believe they truly did see something, or uh, you know, thought they saw something. But you know, it's uh, it, it's kind of hard for me to really grasp onto, as opposed to like a you know a Bigfoot, which I have seen. Or a, a wing being, which I have seen. So uh, I, I guess it, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, if you saw it, though, then I might believe it more. But uh, who knows? Yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. I, and I just know, I've talked to people who've actually seen them. And I know there's, like, I can tell when someone's called me if they actually seen it or not. 
especially once I start getting in the recount the encounter. Like there are some people who are too excited. They're like, oh, I want to tell you the story. They're really, really excited. They're really, really amped up. But then there's people who've really seen something that scared the hell out of them. They're not excited, man. They're 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 damn near in tears yeah. when they're telling that story. And um, you have to pause them. You have to stop them. You have to say, hey, I need you to come back from where you were or where you are mentally. And, you know, you're sitting on the sofa right now. You're not experiencing this again. So um, there are different techniques you can use. I'll tell you one thing that's freaky that I heard that I really, I don't want to go here, but I, I might just go down there just to see. So um, I started doing a lot of marketing um, where I started putting like classified ads in the newspapers, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I started giving like flyers out at truck stops. Like I just started doing all kinds of stuff because I wanted to make sure I kept to the true to this tradition of what the Dark Waters brand is, which is regular people's stories that are calling me. And I wanted to move away from kind of the social media phone calls, which is kind of to me, it's kind of like become poison fruit because everybody's listening to podcasts and everybody's kind of mixing up stories. So I just started marketing directly to people. So I went down um, to Homa and I started going to the boat docks and handing out flyers and I put up a poster, right? You see anything strange and weird on the water? Call me, I'm Dark Waters and I'll pay you for the story. Boom, right? Man, I get a call from a guy and this is so freaky because I've heard of stuff like this before, but I, I, I never really had a good story about it. And he says, he says, Hey man, you want to hear about this monster I saw in uh and ba- uh what's it called ba- Bateman Lake? And I was like a monster. And he's like yeah. And I was like well sure. I, I listen to all kinds of stories. And he was like well you know where the lake is. I'm like nah, I don't really have a clue. And he's like well look it up. And he was like it's down about a mile away from getting to the Gulf. And he's like but it's just a lake. And he said you got to kind of drive through these canals to get in there. He said but they got good red fish and good trout in there. So he goes fishing all the time. Uh-huh. <laughs> and the guy's like, man, I'm in the lake. He said, I got my trolling motor on and I'm just casting my line out and I'm reeling in fish. He said, and I noticed this disturbance on the other end of the lake working its way towards me. And he said, I figured it was like some dolphins or something because they have dolphins in there. And he's like, you know, sure enough, it's dolphins. As it gets close, he said, but I realized, man, it's like 15 dolphins all moving in the same direction. And he was like, how much time you spend on the boat? I said, well, I used to go fishing a lot and I've seen dolphins in the water. And, and he was like, yeah, but you never see 15, 16 dolphins together. <laughs> no. I was like, I said, well, yeah, you might see that in the Gulf. He's like, you don't see it in a lake. And I'm like, well, yeah. I said, every time I've ever seen one, I seen one, maybe two. He was like, yeah. And I'm like, well, what was going on? He said, well, man, you're not going to believe this. I said, bro, I've heard way more wilder stuff than dolphins, man. I, he's like, no, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, well, what is it? He says, the dolphins jumping out of the water, they swimming, and he said, they hauling, he said the A word. And uh, he said, then I noticed there's this wake behind them. And I'm like, wake? And he was like, yeah, like a wake. He was like, like literally, like it looks like a boat's moving behind them, but ain't no boat. And this is that where he said, man, ain't no boat out there but me. I'm the only person on the lake. He's like, this thing, whatever this is, is moving. I'm like, all right, cool. I said, well, give me your position relative to the dolphins and relative to this this action. He's like, well, I'm going, it's like making a T to me. He said, I'm facing left to right, and it's coming straight at me. The dolphins are coming straight towards me, and whatever this is is coming straight towards me. He's like, once I realized how big the wake was behind them, he said, I turned the motor and started trolling towards the bank and headed that way. He said, as I started headed towards the bank, the dolphins started heading over towards the bank. And I'm like, okay, this is getting good. I said, well, what did you see? He said, man, you're not going to believe. He kept on saying, you're not going to believe this, man. You're not going to believe me. I said, I promise you, I'm going to believe you. Just tell me what's going on. Then he starts to kind of stutter and stammer. And he's like, well, one of the dolphins gets up on me and it jumps out of the water. And Jay, when it jumps up, he's like, it jumps. And then it dives. He said, I can see it shooting back down under the water as deep as it could. He said, but then this head rises out of the water. I'm like, head. And he's like, yeah, a head rises out of the water. I'm like, okay, a head, what do you mean? He's like, a head, like it looks like a snake head rises out of the water. He said, then it dives in the water right after the dolphin. And I'm like, what? Huh. And he's like, yeah. I said, dude, I'm, I'm like, bro, time out, rewind. 
because I've heard about these giant kind of like serpent creatures that are known to be down in South Louisiana. I've heard people talk about them. Uh-huh. Like when out fishing with my dad when I was a kid, like it was, you know, we'd be out on the water and he'd be like, yeah, you don't want one of them uh, sea serpents to get you down here. You know, we got them. And fishermen always talked about it, but I never really had somebody tell me a story about it. So I'm familiar with what he's talking about, but I've never actually had anybody tell me a story. So I said, okay, pause, let's rewind. I like I want to I want to hear everything. He's like, no, I'm going to tell you everything. I said, no, go back to the wake part. I said, you know, describe the wake to me. He's like, man, you've seen a boat move in the water, right? And I was like, yeah. He said, a boat moves in the water, it leaves a wake where there's these waves. I said, well, did and now I'm chunking down. Were there white caps? Or was it just waves? He's like, no, there was no white caps. It wasn't pushing water to where it was white caps. He said, but it was waves, like something huge is moving through the water. I'm like, okay, cool. Because in my mind, I'm thinking he's talking like a boat engine. And you know how a boat engine turns up the water and it's white. He's like, no, no, no. He said, imagine a boat pushing through the water, but the engine not churning up the white part, but the waves are high like that. I'm like, okay, cool. And then he says, well, at this point in time, I see the head come out of the water. I'm at the center council on the boat, and I'm trying to crank the boat up to actually shoot away. He says he gets the boat cranked up, and he starts shooting away towards the bank, literally driving his boat up towards the bank. He's like, I was about to run the boat onto land just to get away. And he says, as I'm turning it to the right to go towards the, uh, towards the bank, he says, I see another dolphin jump out of the water, and then something snaps at it. He's like, as it's coming out of the water, the tail's coming out of the water, something snaps at it. He said, I see the blood. He said, because there's water in the, or there's blood in the water. He said, but I don't see if it bit the tail off or if it bit it or how did it happen? He said, but I saw it snapping at it out of the corner of my eye. Then I saw the blood. And I was like, bro, I would have peed in my pants, man. I said, I literally would have peed in my pants. And I said, did you get, were you able to get your cell phone out? (laughs) And he was like, do you think I was thinking about a damn cell phone? I was like, yeah, I wouldn't have been thinking about no cell phone either, bro. <laughs> right. I said, I really wouldn't have been thinking about no cell phone. I said, well, what did you do? He said, man, I pulled that boat as close up to the bank as I could. He said, I got off the boat and got onto land. He said, it really wasn't real land. He said, I got onto as much land as I could. He you know, said, so I sat there for an hour and I waited. And he said, I watched this go back and forth in a circle for like 30, 45 minutes and all the activity stopped. So then I got my boat and I punched it and I went back out, out the canal and went back to the boat dock. And I said, bro, that would have scared the crap out of me, man. I said, it really would have scared the crap. I said, have you been fishing again? He's like, nah, bro, I'm not going in that area anymore. He's like, I'll go fishing, but I'm not going in that lake no more. And I was like, wow, wow. And, that, and the description, it was crazy because the description of the head said it looked like a giant snakehead. And I was like, whoa. So, I wanted to know about the eyes. This is the creepy thing. Uh I said, can you tell me about the eyes? And he was like, you know how a a snake has um, the eyes with the slit in it? And I was like, yeah. He said, but it had a black slit, but it had this really, really kind of um, light blue kind of eye part. He's like, you know how we have like the iris or eye, what the color is? He said, it was really, really light blue. And I was like, well, what color was it? He was like, it was like a dark brown to blackish color. I said, well, bro, that's pretty freaky, man. I said, that's pretty, pretty freaky. He actually wants to do an interview with me to talk about it. And I'm going to have him on to, just to, so everybody else can hear him tell the story because he was freaking out, man. He was, he was completely freaked out by it. And I've heard, again, I've heard about those serpents. I heard about people um, seeing them. And I have a friend of mine named Haywood. I could tell Haywood's name because nobody's going to mess with him because he's certified cra- crazy. And uh, he worked on all rigs and he used to tell me. All my friends down here, my nickname is Black, B-L-A-C-K, because I smoke cigars and I'm a big black guy. He's like, Black, we was on a rig and, man, they had this big old snake in the water. And he's, you know, he just said it in conversation a couple of times um, like it was nothing to it. And I was like, what do you mean a big old snake? He's like, man, a snake big enough to circle around the rig, a big old snake. And I was like, man, there's no such thing as a big old snake. Man, I'm telling you, I can call my boy and he'll tell you about the big snake. So I've heard about it before. Plenty of times, I just, you know, I never had anybody who saw something that close. So, that, that, I know that that was freaky, man. That was absolutely well, freaky. Well, I'll be honest with you. I have never heard anything like that before. And, yep, uh, that's crazy, man. Especially down your neck of the woods because, uh, I mean, I've heard a lot of different stuff down there. But, 
<laughs> not, not a big snake that chases dolphins. And oh my lord. Mm -hmm. But that's, but you know, Lon, that's why I wanted to start marketing. What I discovered about like marketing on Facebook and Twitter is you're actually marketing the people who, and what I mean by marketing, marketing for stories is you're marketing the people who actually are consuming content, right? Right, right. So you're getting, to me, you're kind of getting a little bit of a tainted kind of well, not necessarily saying that people are lying, but also they're listening to content. So you, you, the probability of somebody telling you something that's made up is significantly higher. Um, when you start talking to nurses and, um, and police officers and fishermen and putting stuff directly in their hands and then saying, Hey, no, 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 I'm not playing with you, man. Look me up on YouTube. Look me up on this. Look yeah. me up. I was on coast to coast. Then they kind of look at you like, well, maybe I can tell this guy the story that happened to me. Right, and they're right. like, then they tell you, you know, but it's, it's a much harder road to hold to get the content, but it's real content from real people. You know what I'm saying? That's what my brand is built on real content from real people. The problem is when you start getting with people who consume a lot, you, it really makes it hard to kind of weed through it. It really, really does. You know, it really, really does. So I'd rather just get it, you know, straight from the horse's mouth. And I know I marketed directly to that person. I know I did. Like there's a guy who works at the airport. I was in the airport um, coming back from Dallas and he handles, you know, the, the guys that put the bags on the planes. And when you get mm -hmm. off the plane, you'll, you know, you be bored. And normally there's like one or two guys who are standing there when you're getting off the plane, they're not pilots. They just work at the bottom of the plane and, and fuel the plane or whatever. So I'm getting off the plane. I'm handing out my flyers and guy says, Hey, Hey, Hey man, well, what's this? And I said, well, this is what I do. I'm a paranormal storyteller. You got any stories you ever want to tell, you know, just give me a call. And he kind of looks at me weird. And he's like, I got a couple of stories. I wouldn't mind telling you about this airport. I'm like, well, okay, cool. I let me about the airport and I go on about my business. That night he calls me and talks about being on the, I guess what's, I guess it's the tarmac where you stand on the plane, where you walk around and at New Orleans airport late at night and seeing UFOs. And he was like, bro, do we see so many UFOs out here? He was like, it's ridiculous. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, you never, you don't realize it's dark here out here. And I was like, mm -hmm. you never really think about it. It's dark on that, on that tarmac. It's not like they got a whole bunch of lights. It's dark. He's like, bro, we see all kinds of crap. He's like, the other day we saw a flying triangle, me and my boy. And I was like, call your boy. He's like, I can't call him right now, but I have him. Call. So he started telling me all these different UNO sightings, UFO sightings they're having at New Orleans airport. And I'm like, bro, that's dangerous, right? He's like, yeah, but they get out of the way. I was like, well, I've never seen a UFO when I'm, you know, taking off at night. He's like, well, I've seen them. So yeah. I, it's really working out well to market that way to people, you know? Well, I'm I'm glad it is. Uh, how can people get a hold of you, DW? Uh, the easiest way to get a hold of me is to go to imdarkwaters.com, which is the website, and, and there's a scrolling image with my phone number right there. And you can just call, and then I call people back. Sounds good. Well, you know what? I'm going to have to get you back on here soon, and uh, we'll pick up where we left off here, okay? All right, sounds good, man. I thought we was going. I was running out of time that quick. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, hey, man, thanks for thanks again for being on the show. Oh, you're welcome, buddy. Good talking to you. And I'll be talking to you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Listeners can share their support for Arcane Radio by becoming a patron. Simply go to phantomsandmonsters.com and click the Podbean patron banner. I want to thank Quartz Park 1960 for becoming the newest patron. Arcane Radio also accepts direct donations. Now, if you have an unexplained encounter or sighting, feel free to contact me through Phantoms and Monsters blog site. I want to again thank Dark Waters for joining me this evening, and I want to thank you for listening to the show. Good night, and have a safe and happy weekend.